is. So we had four events that brought us to where we are today in Culture War 2.0. Event one was surprisingly the fall of Occupy. Uh, there was uh, an energy in the air when Occupy was going on, a revolutionary spirit uh, with the left. Um, it was a class-based left. And when Occupy fell, there was a, a period of leftist activism on the left that went kind of quiet in the mainstream from around uh, 2011 to 2015. And during this time, uh, the left at least publicly pivoted towards more of a social justice uh, ideas, more, more of a, what they call woke. And what was interesting to notice during this time period, because it seemed like social justice was in the air and it was just amplifying. And corporations co-opted the social justice memes, uh, specifically HR departments and PR departments. And we had this kind of provocative line is that corporations can be woke, but they can't be anti-capital. So this essentially neutered the left for a time period, uh, the, the, the class-based left. And it sort of amplified the social justice narrative in society at large. So the second event was uh, Oberfell versus Hodges. This is when the Supreme Court in America uh, legalized gay marriage across the country. And as Rod Dreyer said, this was the death blow uh, to the religious right. This was the end of the culture war, uh, as he put it, or culture war 1.0, uh, as we framed it. And this was sort of the beginning of culture war 2.0. So event three, uh, we provocatively said, was Caitlyn Jenner. And I recall hearing something uh, from Joe Rogan, or what I believe I heard from Joe Rogan, and he essentially said that the reason why Trump won was because Caitlyn Jenner. You know, right when uh, the gay marriage uh, legislation was passed, the trans issue just rushed into uh, the public, uh, public mind. Um, and a lot of people might have not been ready for this. This slew of trans issues started arising. Uh, bathroom bills, uh, trans athletes, uh, and pronouns. And a lot of famous figures in the culture war uh, came on the scene due to these issues. A lot of the figures in the intellectual dark web, for example, like Ben Shapiro um, and our Toronto's own Jordan Peterson uh, came out specifically uh, for the pronoun issue. Event four, the chaos president Donald Trump and there, there was something in the air uh, when, when Trump was running. It just felt like chaos, something, uh, we were seeing something that hasn't happened before. And there's a quote by Trump too, he says, he loves chaos. And maybe it's a part of his negotiation strategy of how he makes people, uh, puts people in a state of uncertainty. And he's bringing his business techniques and his negotiation techniques to the political arena. And during this time too, there there's weird occurrences with uh, Pepe the Frog, uh, the Chaos God, and there's just a, the sense that something was going on that was stabilizing to everyone. So we talked about six crises and four events that led to Culture War 2.0. And I think it's uh, useful to have uh, these in mind because they offer sort of a historical and then philosophical uh, events that occurred um, that sort of give uh, understanding of where we are today. So the first one that we, we talked about was secularization and the meaning crisis. And how I hold the meaning crisis, or one way that I, I hold it, is there's this lack of meta narrative or grand narrative that sort of justifies an ecology of practices that can engender uh, and sustain a felt sense of meaningfulness. And we don't have that anymore. Uh, we reference the, the famous Nietzschean line, God is dead, and the idea that once the Christian meta-narrative got destroyed in society, there was no justification for doing a lot of things that might engender that state of meaningfulness. And a lot of uh, secular theorists, they, they have this term called the subtraction theory of secularization, and the idea that once you remove uh, religion from our formal institutions will become all rational and scientific. But as uh, the famous Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor points out, that's not the case. Uh, we won't be evolving around a new meta-narrative of science and rationality. 
we're more likely to um, evolve into a state of plurality where all these different viewpoints are wrestling with each other. The next crisis is the reality crisis and the ingredient associated with that is fragmentation. And I like Scott Adams' analogy of the, the two movie screens in the culture war. So you're looking at the same reality, like let's say something about Trump's impeachment, and uh, CNN is like raging against Trump. He's, he's, he's literally Hitler. And then Fox News is viewing Trump as some sort of savior. And uh, Scott Adams invites everyone to have this two movie screen idea to look at reality through these lenses. Um, but we suggest in our white paper is that it's not just two movie screens, it's a Netflix variety level of reality tunnels coming at us. And if we're sensitive to all the ones that are active, then we might get a better sense of how to navigate this space. And uh, the French postmodern philosopher Lyotard, he calls the postmodern condition not one of relativism, but one of fragmentation. And that is the sense that we're in a, a situation where all these different metaphysics and epistemologies are actively trying to impose themselves and sense make, but without communicating with each other. Atomization and the belonging crisis. I like the, the notion of Martin Buber's I it versus I thou relating. And I think we're in a situation where, and you can kind of like plop in your capitalism critique, uh, that we're in a I it relating environment. And C. Wright Mills, uh, he has a, a wonderful term called the marketing mentality. It's not only am I treating you as an instrument to use to get to something, I'm also making myself an instrument for, to be used uh, so you can get to something. And this is sort of a, a sense of bullshits in the air. People are not relating for its own sake. They are relating in order to the profit motive or, or uh, means to an end. And I think there's a sense of deep, deep loneliness that's uh, associated with this. And so people are running towards uh, things maybe they shouldn't be running towards, such as mimetic tribes. So individuals are instrumentalizing each other. The I it in Buber terms is I'm treating you as an object to get something from you and not treating you as a, a human being that I can relate with. So globalization and the proximity crisis, all these tech utopianists, they thought that the internet or Facebook or social media was gonna be a panacea, they're gonna connect everyone, but that has not been the case. And uh, another Canadian philosopher, uh, Toronto's own uh, Marshall McLuhan, he predicted uh, the situation, he called it the global village. And he viewed it as a point where disagreements will occur on all fronts. He did not have uh, a naive view of the situation. And uh, philosopher Byung Chal Han, uh, he says that distance creates respect, but when you don't have that distance from someone or their viewpoints, when you know too much about them, then a spectacle emerges, then, then, then battles uh, occur. And this is uh, kind of verified by modern uh, psychologists when they have these terms called uh, dissimilarity cascades. The more you actually know about someone, the, the more you dislike them. And uh, environmental spoiling. Uh, once, envir once you don't like someone in an environment, it corrupts the whole, the whole ecosystem. And so, you know, the, the whole saying, uh, good fences make good neighbors. We tore down our fences. We can peer inside someone's worldview, someone's philosophy. And it's triggering, especially if it uh, transgresses our, our sacred values. And I love this saying, uh, in my more naive days, uh, you know, if you know someone's complete story, you cannot help but love them. And that might be true, but maybe the step before that is you have to hate them. So stimulation in the sobriety crisis, we're living in a state of uh, what they call uh, supernormal stimuli, that uh, due to the profit motive or, or whatever, there's certain stimuli that are just so extreme, so exaggerated, that it triggers our evolutionary response. Uh, porn, pornography is an example of this, uh, laugh tracks, uh, junk food, sugar, whatever. And social media is a prime example of this. Uh, the likes, you know, we're hunting for the likes and we've been addicted to these platforms in very subtle ways too. We referenced this study on the jewel beetle. So in Australia, there was this jewel beetle that almost went extinct. And the reason why is because uh, there was these beer stubbies that uh, people started throwing uh, in, in their kind of ecosystem. And they kind of looked like a female's uh, butt, right? Uh, and the males, 
they started having or attempted into having intercourse with these beer stubbies, and they were dying off because they, it was just, it was so exaggerated uh, the beer stubby that they were trying to make love with it, and they just were starving to death. They were attacked, being attacked by ants, and so the population almost went extinct. And then once they started removing uh, these beer stubbies, then they started coming back. And we use that as a metaphor for our current situation. So the weaponization in the warfare crisis, we start this section off by talking about Alexander Dugin, which some people refer to as Putin's brain or the most dangerous philosopher in the world. And uh, he wrote a book in the late 90s, sort of outlining some of the stuff that Russia is doing today about sowing discord uh, in America, in America's internal politics. And uh, the strategy there was to fund and, and, and support radical groups within America to make them fight each other. And uh, by following the 2016 election and, and the Russian uh, sock puppet army, um, they did this strategy. They, they, did, uh, they fund Bernie Sanders, the, the Green Party, Trump. They even, Trumped, uh, they even funded a, a pro and anti-Trump rally at the same time just to create what some uh, people call chaos operations, create chaos for its own sake. And it's just not Russia doing this. It's, it's other countries, um, corporations, lone wolf hackers, medic mercenaries like Cambridge Analytica. Everyone is trying to weaponize our mind right now. And we're in a, a vulnerable state because we're addicted to these platforms, referencing back to the sobriety crisis. We're being weaponized for reasons we're not even aware of.